Hello everyone, um, number six in that series of lectures entitled Thought is Word Dynamics, which is very much a theory uh, underlying um, the work I've been doing in artificial intelligence um, un until now, and in particular underlies a piece of uh, software of AI I had developed at the end of the 80s for British Telecom called Anella Associative Network with Emerging Logical and Learning Abilities. Um, lectures one to five can be found in uh, on YouTube, uh, as will this, the current one, the one you're watching. Um, not too ambitious today, um, a single chapter of my text, the one which is called Chapter 5, which is entitled called The Individual Unit of the Network, is a word pair. Um, what is the network that we're talking about? It is a network that we've already established is somewhere in our brain. Uh, we have um, shown converging evidence that it is a neural network. And um, what is special, um, probably, is that, that to these neurons are attached um, pairs of words. Um, not anything at a lower level, such as sub-symbolic. I have no hypothesis how this, how this is being operated. Uh, the only thing uh, that I've already underlined in, the, um, in these lectures, all along I developed my work, I made an effort, a consistent effort, to show how my hypo hypotheses were consistent with the existence of a net underlying network which has the capacities and the properties that we know about the neural net we have in our mind, in our head, somewhere in our brain. The individual unit of the network is a word pair. As we said, mathematically speaking, a graph is a set of ordered pairs. It can be decomposed in elementary units of pairs, say cat and feline, and each word can be part of more than one of such pairs. Feline may be associated again, this time with mammal, and cat with whiskers, etc. Once admitted that what we're talking about is a network, it becomes self-evident that its individual units are word pairs. It is, however, possible to go well beyond this trivial observation. The origin of the medieval notion of the categorem, categorems being opposed to sync categorems, categorem are what, what we call content words. Uh, sync categorems are words that we call structure words, like nonetheless. Um, a categorem is something like um, Aristotle, a cat, uh, a rose, and so on. The origin of the medieval notion of the category is in Aristotle's short treatise on words called categories. That's where the word category comes from, from the Greek. Here, in that book, categories, the philosopher is only concerned with those words that can act as either a subject or a predicate in a sentence. Blue is predicated of the subject violets when I say violets are blue. But color is predicated of blue, the subject, when I say blue is a color. It is clear that the word so distinct, excuse me, it is clear that the word so distinguished as being able to act as subject or predicate amount to those I called earlier content, content words. Why should they be called categories? Because Aristotle argues they can be used in 10 different ways with 10 different functions, because there are 10 points of views from which stuff can be looked at. The various meanings of being these equals categories. Here is an explanation, his explanation. I'm uh, quoting in his own words. Expressions which are in no way composite signify substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, position, state, action, or affection. These are the 10 categories in Aristotle. To sketch my meaning roughly, examples of substance are man or the horse, of quantity, such terms as two cubits long or three cubits long, 
of quality, such attributes as white, grammatical. Double half greater fall under the category of relation. At the marketplace, in the Lyceum, under that of place. Yesterday, last year, under that of time. Lying, sitting are terms indicating position. Short armed indicate state. To lance, to cauterize indicate action. To be lanced, to be cauterized indicate affection. No one of these terms in, in and by itself involves an affirmation. It is by the combination of such terms that positive or negative statements arise. For every assertion must, as is admitted, be either true or false. Whereas expressions which are not in any way composite, such as men, white, runs, wins, cannot be either true or false. And I remember, I remind you that the person who invented what we call logic, um, although he never used that particular word, logos, the word logos being much too vague in, uh, in, in um, ancient Greece, what he called the analytics, the dialectics and the rhetorics, uh, which to us composed together logic. He was the first person to express explicitly the rules which are underlying these ways of uh, speaking correctly. How do we combine views about different things in order to come to a conclusion of what he called a syllogism and a correct conclusion to a syllogism? He established the rules of how that works and as Hegel uh, mentioned uh, much later on, he had found them all. The most important in this passage that I've just read from Aristotle's categories, the most important in this passage are the final words. Isolated terms, terms taken on their own, cannot be regarded as either true or false. I open the inverted commas. It is by the combination of such terms that positive or negative statements arise. What can, one can even go one step further. Does the term, term in isolation mean anything? Of course, it's one tempted to say, indeed, as I said earlier, we had no loss when asked to define a term like rose. We gave as an example of doing this. Um, a rose is a flower that has many petals, often pink, a strong and very pleasant fragrance, a thorny stem. We spontaneously assign the rose the category of substance, of being a flower. We assign quantity to its petals for being many. We attributed the quality of being pink to its petals. In other words, we brought the rose out of its isolation by connecting it with other words in sentences of which, as Aristotle observed, it will then be possible to say if they are true or false. Out of the examples that Aristotle mentions, it is blatant that double, half, greater, two cubits long, lying, sitting, short, armed, runs, wins, have no meaning unless they are said, predicated of something else. But after a moment of reflection, it becomes obvious that this applies to the other words too, man, horse, white. As we've seen when looking at what is called a definition of a rose, they also need to, say, to be said of something to come alive. In a passage of one of his dialogues, the sophist, Plato this time, not Aristotle, I, I, I um, remind you that they were co contemporaries. In the sophist, Plato has the stranger from Ilia making a very identical point to that of Aristotle. I'm quoting from the sophist, one of Plato's dialogues. The stranger is speaking. A succession of nouns only is not a sentence, any more than of verbs without nouns. A mere succession of nouns or of verbs is no discourse. I mean that words like walks, runs, sleeps, or any other words which denote action, however many of them you string together, do not make discourse. Or again, 
when you say lion, stag, horse, or any other words which denote agent, neither in this way of stringing words together do you attain to discourse. When anyone says, a man learns, should you not call this the simplest, simplest and least of sentences? And he not only names, but he does something by connecting verbs with nouns. And therefore we say that he discourses and to this connection of words, we give the name of discourse. Same point as with Aristotle, words in isolation do actually mean nothing because as soon as we use them, we say something about them, about the notion which has been summoned by that particular word. And only then do we say something which can be decided to be determined to be uh, true or false. Griswold, the philosopher, notices that apart from Parmenides, the anonymous stranger in this is the single figure in all the dialogues which who speaks like a full-blown philosopher. He observes that also that while Socrates is present in the sophist, he remains almost mute. Assuming that there is in the brain a network being the substrate for speech performance, what would be its element, the smaller unit, to be stored in such a network? We hold that it would be the word pairs just described, instead of words in isolation. Synaptic connections seem the perfect locus for such storage, the place where the building blocks of the brain's biological network, the neurons, come together. Why not the isolated word? Because, as Aristotle saw it, Word pairs are true or false, and as we will see next, something being true or false is the first condition for it having an effective value, i.e. what brings in motion the dynamics of speech performance. I will, I will show that that network I'm describing uh, only starts moving around, being able to do something if there are affect values. Uh, which are attached to these word pairs and makes it possible for a gradient descent when producing a sentence, when we speak, when we speak to others or whether we speak to ourselves or whether these are just disparate thoughts within our minds, we need to go from one place to another and it is emotion that does the job. Thank you so much.